Success. Everyone dreams of it. Everyone strives for it. But not everyone achieves it. Success can mean different things to different people. As we pause to celebrate 25 years of Avoid This Land, we ask ourselves, how do we measure success? Avoid This Land was founded in 1994. With humble beginnings in a small office, and a vision of creating quality, innovative properties for the Cebu market. And our very first residential development, North Town Homes, a master-planned community now touted as Cebu's most prestigious address. Our very first industrial development, West Cebu Industrial Park in Balamban, a sprawling 268-hectare industrial estate ideal for medium to heavy industries such as shipbuilding and allied activities that helped create thousands of jobs for the residents of Balamban and transformed it from a fourth class to a first class municipality. Our first commercial development, the outlets at Pueblo Verde. The first outdoor outlet mall in Cebu offering exciting new shopping and dining experiences. Emboldened by the success of these pioneering developments, Aboitis Land ventured forth into bigger and more ambitious projects, spreading its footprint in Cebu and beyond. Aboitis Land in 2019 has grown by leaps and bounds since our first inception. Our workforce has grown exponentially, and so has our business. Thousands of hectares of land have been transformed into innovative, deliberately planned, and purposely designed residential, commercial, and industrial communities that elevate the living experience. And with our growth come the rewards, not only in revenue, but also in things far more valuable, like the number of people whose lives we have touched and changed for the better, our vecinos. Avoid This Land takes this further with various programs designed to give Filipinos a chance to create better ways to live for themselves, ensuring that our developments positively impact our neighbors and our surrounding ecosystem, advancing the communities that host us as we advance our business. No matter how we quantify 25 years of achievements, it is what we have yet to do that holds the most promise for Aboitis Land. More strategic partnerships to be forged. More fully integrated townships to be built. More industrial parks that fortify businesses and create opportunities. More commercial centers that elevate lifestyles. And more residential communities where individuals and families will live love, and grow. Aboitis Land. After 25 years, one thing is clear. We've only just begun. As we cherish our glorious past and celebrate today's victories, we forge ahead into an exciting future. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Chua, and I welcome you to our first Aboitis Land webcast. In the spirit of creating better ways to live, Aboitis Land is holding a series of webcasts that touch on a variety of topics in the context of the new normal. Today, we are tackling residential real estate, the new normal and beyond. To take us through the realities and opportunities the new normal brings, I would like to introduce today's speaker. He is a Senior Research Manager at Colliers International Philippines. He conducts macroeconomic analysis and regularly assesses the impact of economic growth to the real estate sector. His reports have been featured on national news programs such as CNN Philippines, Market Edge with Kathy Yang, 
ANC, Bloomberg Philippines, Business World Live, and international and national dailies. He also writes a regular column for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. To talk about the realities and opportunities that the new normal will bring, please welcome Mr. Joey Roy Bondok. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning to Avoid This Land and the good morning to our webinar participants. Um, it's really you know, in uncertain times that uh, we are uh, seeing right now. And um, I believe that uh, we are seeing the new normal uh, for the Philippine economy, for the Philippine property sector in general. And um, I would like to thank Aboitis Land for inviting me and the Colliers International to be part of this uh, webinar uh, on real estate, the new normal and beyond what do we see going forward and how should developers and uh, investors recalibrate amid the uncertainties that we're seeing in the market. So let me present you, let me show you my uh, screen. Okay, uh, just wanna confirm if, uh, okay, so. I think you can see it now. So let me uh, do a quick uh, macroeconomic review. What do we see in the economy? Uh, what the government has announced so far? So if uh, you're following uh, business and economic news, uh, you probably heard about the Philippine economy contracting by a uh, 0.2% in the first quarter of 2020. So a lot of analysts were somehow startled by that news because they were somehow still projecting a positive growth for the Philippines. So they are now looking at the deeper contraction for the second and third quarter of 2020. But what's optimistic uh, for the economy and for the property even is that the central bank, while it is forecasting a 0.8% contraction for the Philippine economy in 2020, it is projecting a faster recovery rebound, a 7.8% growth in the, the uh, or the annual growth for 2021. So that's, that's a quick pickup from the contraction or slowdown that we are projecting for 2020. Now this uh, slide here, the next few slides that you'll see uh, just summarizes what these uh, multilateral agencies and credit rating firms are seeing um, for the Philippine economy in the next 12 months. So overall, they're all looking at a contraction, a slowdown for the Philippine economy, but they are one in saying that for 2021, we will definitely see an economic recovery. And of course, that should also benefit the property sector, residential development, especially condominium and house and lot projects being developed in key areas outside of Metro Manila, including Calabarzon and Cebu areas. Now, uh, there were initial concerns with the lockdown implemented here in Luzon because 73 percent of the country's economy is being generated in these uh, the Luzon group of islands. But what's optimistic also, and this, as this slide shows you, is that the GDP per capita here in the Philippines has continuously been increasing since year 2000. So even if we had the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, for instance, um, the um, GDP per capita of every Filipino or the income of every Filipino has continuously been increasing. And as you can see, uh, from 1,600 in 2000, this increased to more than 3,000 US dollars per capita in 2018. And of course, if uh, the incomes of Filipinos are rising, that gives them greater ability, propensity to buy houses. And uh, of course, every Filipino's aspiration is to buy his or her own condominium unit or house, right? So that should help propel the demand for residential sector here in Metro Manila. Um, if we're looking at the GDP growth per region, and as you can see here, some regions are doing even better than the national capital region, than Metro Manila. Look at um, Central Visayas, for instance, where Cebu is a part of, that's going by 7.6%. Central Luzon, uh, Pampanga is a part of uh, this region. We have Ecija is growing by 7.1%. Even Calabarzon, so we have Cavite, Laguna, Batangas, growing by 7.3%. So these regions have been 
um, dictating the growth of the Philippine economy and have even been outpacing the growth of the national capital region, the country's capital for economic activities. Now, in terms of shared to GDP, these regions uh, outside of Metro Manila have also been contributing significantly to the country's economic output. Central Luzon, 10%. Calabarzon, this is a, a, a very good figure, 17%. And even Central Visayas, pretty decent uh, contribution is about 6% uh, contribution to the country's economic output. So all these three regions are contributing for more than 30%, about a third of the country's GDP. So as you can see here, there's so much growth potential in these uh, regions moving forward. Now, remittances continue to drive economic uh, growth, um, and they cover about 10% of the country's GDP. So that is good news. While uh, some analysts are projecting a decline in 2020, they are also optimistic that when the global economies and the Philippine economy recover in 2021, there will be a substantial pickup also in OFW remittances. And there's some reports by um, remittance companies, uh, and according to them, 25% of the money being sent in by Filipinos is being allocated on loans. And out of those loans, of course, a huge chunk of that is uh, the money allocated for housing loans. So um, if we see OFW remittances growing, definitely we will continuously see that allocation for housing continuously rising here in the Philippines. And as I mentioned, those uh, key regions that I, ha I highlighted uh, previously are also contributing a lot to OFW deployment. Imagine a central zone, which covers also Pampanga and Nueva Ecija, accounting for 14% of total deployment in 2018. Calabar zone, 18% uh, share the total OFW deployment in 2018 and also Central Visayas covering 6%. So um, anecdotally, we believe that um, the remittances being sent in by Filipinos working abroad is also uh, being spent on housing loans, on their um, residential requirements. And as you can see here, these three regions are um, three of the uh, major regions that uh, supply uh, workforce abroad and uh, have been leading other regions in terms of OFW deployment um, in the Philippines. Now, um, one key indicator that we believe still works so well for the Philippine economy and for the residential demand is low um, mortgage rates. And uh, we are no longer seeing the Asian financial levels of 20, 22 uh, percent. The mortgage rates are very low right now, 5 to 7 percent. And we believe that uh, this is one economic indicator that will help um, propel the demand for housing, whether it, it may be condominium or a house and lot or a lot only project outside of a metro Manila. So this is one economic indicator that will sustain that housing demand. Now, let me um, do a quick discussion of uh, what we see, uh, you know, with the COVID-19, um, there's a pronouncement that by the World Health Organization that this COVID-19 pandemic has been contained already in China, most especially, but uh, some economies, of course, are still struggling to contain it. They're grappling with solutions on how to keep their respective economies afloat. And um, what we have noticed also is that there are several comparisons between the COVID-19 and the SARS outbreak of 2003. But we have to note that China right now is an economy that is 700% bigger compared to what it was in 2003. And um, of course, it will have a greater impact not just on, on China alone, but also on countries that have been depending on China for foreign investments, for foreign arrivals. So we believe that this will likely have a greater impact on the global economy. But if we look at other crises, previous crises, uh, you're, you're looking at SARS outbreak, H1N1, MERS-CoV. Um, what's also notable is that for these crises, um, economies were able to recover quickly. Uh, you look at SARS outbreak, uh, if uh, you use tourist arrivals as a proxy, for instance, 
the arrivals picked up immediately after a year, after 12 months. So um, we hope that the lockdown efforts, the quarantine efforts being implemented by the Philippine government and other economies around the world bear fruit so that uh, market sentiment, not just for the entire economy, but also for the property sector, starts to recover by second half of 2020 so that the market will again um, see a very good demand for condominiums uh, and house and lot projects by 2021. Now, we're talking about growth. One of the major drivers of economy still is infrastructure spending. And the government, the Philippine government already announced that um, even if there's COVID-19, even if the government is uh, allotting major a portion of its budget on social amelioration programs and support to micro, small, and medium enterprises. The implementation of infrastructure projects across uh, the country will not be affected. And this slide just shows you how the Philippines has been a laggard in terms of infrastructure spending over the past few years. Only about 2.2% of our GDP is spent on infrastructure, and that is really low compared to other Asian peers. Uh, and it's no longer surprising to see the Philippines ranking disappointingly uh, when it comes to global economic surveys. But what's uh, positive for the current administration is that um, starting 2016, there has been a substantial increase in terms of infrastructure allotment. Um, we're spending more than 5% of GDP on infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of uh, PPP projects, public-private partnership projects being implemented across the country. And the government has assured us citizens and businesses that the construction of railways, of subway, of um, airports will continue um, even if uh, we are experiencing this COVID-19 pandemic. And we believe that infrastructure is one segment that has several multiplier impact on the economy. So we really see several sectors benefiting from this, including property. Why? Because uh, we had a study, Colliers Philippines had a study, and uh, we uh, concluded that um, parcels of land or properties, residential properties or projects that are near the infrastructure projects being implemented by the government will um, experience or see an increase in prices or values uh, once those projects are completed. That's why we're really optimistic with the government's build, build, build program and we hope that it truly uh, delivers uh, with its promise of ushering in the golden age of infrastructure. And this is very important also because the government wants to decentralize. And we see a lot of projects in Pampanga, in northern part, central part of Luzon, in Calabar zone uh, area, even in Cebu. And these are key areas that are very viable property investment destinations. And these cities being major hubs of businesses and property investment in the country will significantly benefit from the build, build, build infrastructure program of the government. Now, speaking of infrastructure, this is also one segment that will benefit from the infrastructure program of the government. And this is the Balik Provincia program. You're probably uh, are hearing a lot of news about this. And we are very excited with this program of the government, especially if this is implemented on a long-term basis. This is not a project that should just be completed or executed in three to six months. This should be for the long-term. And um, if uh, the government continues to build the infra projects as it promised, then it will be able to uh, benefit or provide benefits to a lot of uh, employees, Filipino businesses that would like to decentralize or move outside of Metro Manila. We believe that it's not just the Filipino citizens or employees that will benefit. A lot of businesses also will benefit from this. And even property developers uh, will benefit uh, from the Balik Provincia program because we believe that um, the infrastructure program of the government will help dictate the strategies of these developers moving forward. That's why if this 
uh, Balik Probinsya program bears fruit, then we will probably see more um, property investments in key areas outside of Metro Manila, including Cebu, Pampanga, Cavite, Laguna, Batangas area. So this program really holds a lot of promise and we hope that these uh, programs bear fruit in the near to medium term. Now, I would just like to um, redirect your focus on the infrastructure projects being implemented by the government. And there's a lot of infra projects that uh, are still being constructed and this will be completed even beyond the administration of the uh, current uh, president. But uh, we believe that again, this is for the long term and uh, this will benefit not just the current administration, but succeeding administrations as well. You have, of course, the LX SLEX connector road, which will benefit, say, the likes of Pampanga and in, in the in northern central Luzon area, as well as Cavite, Laguna, Batangas in southern Luzon. You have the Skyway Stage 3. Now, this is a very interesting project, especially from for Kapampangans like me, because this will ease access from Metro Manila all the way to northern part of Luzon, including Pampanga, because this practically helps ease traffic within Metro Manila. So I believe that a lot of uh, um, employees that are based in Pampanga or Bulacan or northern part of Metro Manila will really um, uh, wait for the completion of this project. And this is uh, originally due to be completed in 2020. Um, SLEX Skyway Extension, again, this is one project that will benefit uh, residential house lot projects in Cavite, Laguna, Batangas area because it helps ease uh, traffic leading to those cities outside of Metro Manila. You also have a few projects that will further move uh, north northern part of Luzon, including Tplex extension. Of course, Clark uh, Airport expansion is another exciting uh, project because it will help prop up residential investment and residential demand in major locations north of central north of uh, Luzon, including Pampanga. Uh, Manila Clark Railway, I think uh, this is another project that will complement the Clark Airport extension or expansion project. And this will extend all the way from Manila to uh, Bulacan as well as Pampanga. So really an exciting project, especially for those investors and end users looking for properties in Pampanga. Central Luzon Link Expressway, this is another interesting project. As you can see, it will benefit areas such as Tarlac and Nueva Ecija. So again, a very exciting project uh, and will have a significant impact on property uh, investors in Nueva Ecija as well. We also have a few projects in the uh, southern part of Luzon. So you have the likes of uh, SLEX, uh, 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 four, which we believe will benefit Batangas as well as Quezon areas. Now, those are the projects that we mentioned for Luzon. Uh, we also have projects that uh, we believe will benefit Cebu property. Of course, Cebu is your um, most attractive investment destination outside of Metro Manila. And it's no longer surprising to see a lot of developers such as Boitis Land uh, really ramping up their projects in Cebu, for instance. Uh, this one, Cebu Monorail, uh, we believe will benefit uh, a lot of uh, Cebu residents and will help ease traffic congestion in Cebu City right now. Its original um, completion date is 2022. Uh, Cebu Bus uh, Rapid Transit also is one project that uh, we believe will help ease access and connectivity to areas outside of Cebu City. Now, Cebu Cordova Expressway, this project also holds a lot of promise because um, it practically connects two major cities in Cebu, two major business areas, and will help further spur um, investment opportunities and residential investments in the city. Metro Cebu Expressway, again, a very exciting uh, project that was proposed by the Department of Public Works and Highways. And this will further cut uh, travel time uh, in key cities in the Cebu area. So 
overall, these infrastructure projects definitely will help spur the demand for residential uh, projects in Metro Manila and even outside of the capital region. But um, let me first focus on the Metro Manila condominium market. We have been receiving a lot of queries. What is happening to the Metro Manila condominium market uh, right now, especially that we're seeing the new normal. A lot of uh, developers are adjusting. Investors are on a wait and see. But what do they see uh, going forward? And when will they invest? When will they finally offload that much uh, saved investment or money? And when will they finally acquire that condominium unit? But what we see overall in Metro Manila is that there has been a slower completion of condominium units. And of course, that is uh, attributable to the construction delays all over the capital region because of the lockdown, as well as the social and physical distancing measure protocols uh, being implemented by the government. And I think the government already imposed a lot of um, regulations, guidelines on how to resume public and private construction. But um, even if it totally lifts the lockdown, there will be some physical distancing measures in construction sites, and that will have a significant impact on the completion of new residential projects uh, in Metro Manila. Overall, we have about 132,000 condominium units in um, major business districts in Metro Manila. And this is the supply that we're seeing for 2020. That's almost 11,000 condominium units, and that will uh, rise to about 155,000, close to 156,000 condominium units uh, all over Metro Manila by 2022. The vacancy in the secondary market at 11.3%, so that's still uh, pretty healthy, especially as of Q1 2020. But I would like to also remind you of these three key economic indicators that we believe will have an impact on condominium demand going forward. Um, objectively, we can tell you that uh, there's a slowdown in terms of condominium demand in Metro Manila. But once the market recovers, these three key economic indicators will help you identify or determine if there has been a recovery in residential demand in Metro Manila. So unemployment, um, of course, if uh, the economy recovers and it generates more employment opportunities, then of course that's a positive for the property sector. Interest rates remain low. Um, I think I already showed you a slide earlier that uh, will tell you that interest rates are low, mortgage rates are very competitive. So that should help stoke demand in the property, in the residential market. And consumer confidence, one of the major factors uh, behind the strong consumer confidence is the steady inflow of remittances from Filipinos working abroad. And if these employees, OFWs, continue to send in money, then we're likely to see a sustained consumer confidence all over the country. Now, looking at the price segment uh, that are most uh, attractive in Metro Manila, it is the mid-income and affordable segments that uh, really take up much of the demand. So these are the condo units priced from 1.7 to 6 million pesos per unit. So far, we're seeing these two segments dominating demand for condominium market all over Metro Manila. Currently, what we're seeing in the pre-selling condominium market uh, here in the country's capital is that uh, there has been a discount on pricing. Uh, the down payment is now um, lower 20% from the previous 30% and payment terms have been extended. This is just some of the concession that developers have been implementing to make sure that the demand is sustained all over Metro Manila. Overall, we have 47,600 condominium units uh, in Metro Manila. These are unsold units remaining inventory and um, we believe that uh, this can easily be uh, sold out in a year because in 2018 we saw more than 50,000 condominium units being sold in the pre-selling market so that should sustain the demand in the pre-selling residential sector.
if you you're curious and would like to know where these remaining inventory are so this uh, slide shows you that they're mostly in Paranaque, Manila, Quezon City, Pasig, Mandaluyong, and Cubao, New Manila area. There's not much supply uh, and sold inventory in Taguig, Makati, and Binondo. So if you look at the Philippine economy and property, as you can see here, there has been a sustained um, increase of residential prices as represented by this uh, blue line here. And uh, while the economy has been on a boom and bust cycle, meaning it grows and then it decelerates, the uh, prices of condominium has been on a sustained pace. So even after the uh, global financial crisis, as you can see here, and after major outbreaks such as SARS and H1N1, what we saw is a sustained increase of condominium prices in Metro Manila. And even if you compare it to PSEI uh, stock index, the price of condominium in Metro Manila has also been growing at a sustained pace, uh, unlike the PSEI shares where it is represented by a boom bust growth, which of course is very um, reflective of what's happening in global and domestic economy. It's more vulnerable to global shocks compared to the prices of condominium here in Metro Manila. And as I mentioned earlier, we saw a record take up for condominiums in Metro Manila in 2018. That was 57,000 uh, condominium units sold in the pre-selling market. That's why we believe that, you know, if we see this sustained demand, this level of demand, then that 47,000 remaining inventory as of end 2019 can easily be absorbed by the market. So uh, let me now discuss you discuss with you a few uh, slides on the Visayas Mindanao um, house and lot uh, projects. As you can see from this slide, starting 2018, there was a pretty strong take up of house and lot projects in the Visayas, Mindanao area. Of course, Cebu is uh, one of uh, the major drivers of the take up in the Visayas, Mindanao corridor. And uh, as this slide shows you, 2018 and 2019, the demand for the house and lot projects has outpaced the supply. So that's a good indicator of demand in the market. If you look at the lot only launches and take up for um, 2019, it is again the mid income that is dominating in the Visayas and Mindanao region. So these are the lot only projects from 960,000 to 1.8 million pesos. But you also have the luxury and upscale projects that are growing at a sustained pace. So that's 1.8 million and up per lot only project. If you look at the house and lot launches and take up, again, similar to what we see in the Metro Manila condominium market, these are the projects that are dominating price from 1.7 to 6 million pesos per unit. Again, this is the take up in the Visayas Mindanao region with Cebu, one of the major contributors to the demand. Now, let me now discuss the Luzon horizontal market and it's pretty interesting also why because starting 2015 the launches and take up in areas outside of metro manila but within luzon the take up has been outpacing the supply or the launches from developers and of course for the luzon area we have the likes of uh, pampanga as well as cavite laguna batangas being among the major drivers of demand in the Luzon region. And even for the lot only uh, take up, that is a pretty strong indicator also of how much is uh, being sold in the market and which is the most attractive segment. Um, this is, we were pleasantly surprised when we saw this slide because as this slide shows you, it's the luxury segment that is dominating 2.4 million pesos per unit and up. Uh, we also see a strong demand from upscale and mid-income, 960,000 pesos to about 2.4 million pesos per lot. So these are you know, some projects that are in major urban areas outside of Metro Manila, such as Pampanga, Cavite, Laguna, and Batangas region. For the house and lot launches and the take up, we're seeing a good demand also for the upscale, affordable, and mid-income segment. So oh, these uh, three segments alone accounting for 
more than 80%, nearly 90% of the demand in the Luzon region. So that shows you uh, or indicates the purchasing power of investors as well as end users of house and lot projects in the Luzon region. And the take up for Calabar Zone was also, is also a pretty, um, pretty good. I mean, looking at the take up, uh, the pace of take up starting 2011, there has been a pretty good the record of a take up. Again, we see that demand growing uh, at a faster pace compared to supply. So um, while we might see some slowdown in terms of demand for 2020, it's this pent up demand that uh, we saw starting 2011 that will help prop up uh, take up in the Calabar zone uh, residential market. And we believe that, you know, once uh, uh, the global economies recover and the Philippine economy uh, picks up uh, and recovers its lots, lost ground in 2020, then we will again see this pent up demand for residential market in the Calabar zone region. So we're still optimistic with what we see in the market, uh, especially with uh, this slide from uh, Met for Metro Cebu showing you again a strong take up that we have been recording for the house and lot projects in the Cebu area starting 2014. In fact, for 2018, we saw a record high take up of 2,555 house and lot units in Cebu. So that shows you uh, how strong the demand has been in Metro Cebu for the house and lot segment. So let me just uh, give you a few insights on what we see overall for the residential market. Um, for the supply, um, we are now seeing a slower completion again because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdown imposed by governments in Metro Manila, local governments, city governments in Luzon, as well as in Cebu. So we will definitely see a slower uh, completion of residential projects, condominium or house and lot for 2020. But we believe that once this lockdown has been lifted, there will definitely be a recovery in terms of new supply in the market. For the demand side, we believe that uh, there will be some slowdown for 2020, mainly because um, there's a, uh, some concerns about the local economy as well as some uh, countries wherein we have uh, OFW sending in money to finance their housing loans. But um, a lot of analysts are projecting, multilateral agencies are uh, forecasting a recovery by 2021. Asian Development Bank is pretty aggressive with its forecast for 2021. In fact, they are not seeing a drop in remittances for 2020. So all these factors we believe should help uh, recover uh, in the recovery of the condominium and house and lot market in the Philippines for 2021. And not just that, a lot of um, analysts also are looking at very low interest rates uh, in the near term. The central bank might be more um, aggressive in cutting interest rates, so that should result in lower mortgage rates. So those um, investors or employees in the Philippines or of the beliefs that's are still awash with cash and have the potential still to buy condominium units, will be looking for bargains in the market. And that should also support or add another layer of demand in the market. So um, the, the econo economic recovery by 2021, and we also are seeing that in the office market will help drive the residential market all over the Philippines, especially in key areas outside of Metro Manila. Now we have a few recommendations also for developers, especially, you know, we're seeing this new normal, this webinar that we're doing now is a new normal. We should probably be uh, having this in a, a hotel conference uh, uh, convention center, but because of the new normal, the COVID-19 impact, we are doing this through a webinar, through a call like this. But let me just uh, show you a few recommendations for developers, especially um, how should they capture and or recapture the demand um, going forward. So they should offer more flexible packages, lease terms. We believe a lot of developers are doing this already, both in the pre-selling market uh, as well as in the secondary market, especially 
uh, for developers that have a high number of ready for occupancy units. Now they should also highlight property management because it is important to you know, protect the health uh, and safety of the unit owner. So they sh there should be some sanitation measures, uh, business continuity plans that are in place for the, the property management as well as condominium developers. Um, we believe that developers should um, proactively touch base with their clients through online conferences like this or by sharing relevant uh, reliable materials online on various social media platforms and uh, make sure that the buildings are adaptable to modern technology. Will the buildings be able to uh, support uh, wiring requirements, especially for your internet uh, connection because a lot of people are working from home now. So these factors should be considered by developers going forward. Now for buyers, we believe that every residential investor is opportunistic in nature. So they will definitely be looking or be scouting for cheaper options in the market. But as I mentioned earlier, a lot of investors that still have the capacity to buy condominium units will be looking for cheaper options in the market, especially with the interest rates remaining low and the central bank planning to further cut interest rates. Now, um, for buyers, we have observed that a major consideration for them is to buy condominium units within integrated communities. And that demand is understandable because, you know, this global pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic has really affected the way we live, the way we work. And we want to be in a place where we can have this live, work, play lifestyle, where there is convenience, where we can easily access our essential needs. So that is a very important moving forward. And that has also um, risen or increased the demand for, con for integrated communities, for township projects, not just in Metro Manila, but in major locations outside of the capital region. So it's no longer surprising to see these residential communities, these residential projects in Pampanga, in Cebu, for instance, in Batangas, wherein there are integrated features. You can easily uh, access uh, groceries, uh, supermarkets. You can easily buy your needs, the essential needs. And this will likely be the trend growing forward. And one reason why we see integrated community development becoming a trend moving forward is we believe that developers will follow the infrastructure projects being implemented by the government. So if these projects are extending all the way to Pampanga, then we are likely to see developers building more projects north of Metro Manila. But what's important also is that developers integrate other features within their integrated community. So education, healthcare, and other recreational uh, facilities should also be in that integrated communities. Um, and also, we are seeing new trends in the market. So a lot of uh, developers, uh, for instance, are, you know, maximizing their brand equity, and they have been active in firming a partnership with property management firms. And one of the reasons why they do that is because they want to ensure the health and safety of their unit owners, not just in a condo, but also in a residential uh, house and lot development. Now, this slide shows you the impact of previous crises to the economy as well as the residential market here in the Philippines. Um, for 2020, this COVID-19 pandemic, we are likely to see a U-shaped recovery. So by 2021, there should be a stronger demand in the market. There should be a recovery. And that, of course, should help the property market. And um, the demand, of course, will likely kick in starting Q1 of 2021. But for you know a lot of investors in the market that are still looking for projects, of course, they are aggressively looking for bargains. And this should benefit uh, residential projects, not just for condo, but also for house and lot projects all over the countries, all over the key cities across the country. Now, these are just some trends that uh, we have been 
seeing, uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic, its impact on the economy and its impact on the residential demand of uh, Filipino household and OFWs, um, how have they been rethinking their strategies, their investment strategies, their demand? When, sh when should they uh, finally acquire that uh, much needed condominium unit or much deserved house and lot unit? So one of the trends that we're seeing is the demand for bigger and more open spaces. And uh, a lot of um, Filipino uh, residential buyers are also looking at less dense communities. Um, I've spoken with a lot of brokers, and according to them, they're pleasantly surprised that a lot of residential buyers, especially those that are currently living in Metro Manila, are now looking for units outside of NCR. So they've been receiving queries for residential units in Pampanga, in the Calabar zone area, Central Luzon region. So this is uh, one trend that uh, we are seeing. Also, um, the business continuity plans of a lot of companies have been compelling them to locate outside of Metro Manila. And Cebu is one of those cities that is very attractive for BPO operations, for instance. And of course, the expatriates and some employees will be looking for residential options in these cities. So that should further uh, uh, result in a higher demand for residential uh, units in areas like Cebu. Convenience in a township is a very important feature. Is there a clinic near or within your township? Is there a supermarket, a grocery store that uh, you can uh, immediately go to. So these are key considerations for residential buyers. Developments outside of Metro Manila, there is this Salamudi study where uh, they, the survey results show that there has been a growing demand for um, projects or residential units outside of core locations in Metro Manila. So they've been aggressively looking for um, residential investment uh, destinations outside of Metro Manila. So those key provinces that I mentioned earlier should benefit from this. And also infrastructure-driven development. So as I mentioned, the government's uh, infrastructure program, Build, 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 Golden Age of Infrastructure, should help dictate the strategies of developers moving forward and will help raise land and property values in key areas outside of Metro Manila. And this should also dictate the residential investment options or preferences of Filipinos or households uh, that are continuously aspiring to have or own their own house or condominium here in the country. So overall, uh, we believe that um, the economic recovery in 2021 will help anchor the growth or recovery of residential demand here in the Philippines. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of programs that the government has lined up, um, infrastructure development as well as Balik Provincia. And these programs will definitely help the government in its goal of um, instilling or providing an inclusive growth and should also help uh, a lot of residential investors and buyers decide where should they locate and where should they buy their first condominium or house and lot. We believe that um, the economic recovery, global or domestic, will help uh, restore uh, confidence in the property sector and uh, a lot of uh, Filipino uh, residential investors or buyers will be um, more excited as we see all these infrastructure projects all over the country as well as uh, the economic recovery that we are likely to see starting 2021. So again, that should further stoke interest and demand in the country's property sector. So that uh, concludes my my presentation. I hope you got a thing or a, a thing or two from from the uh, trends that I presented, and I hope you were also able to weigh your options now, your residential investment options, uh, especially with uh, the government's program and what do they intend to implement over the next few quarters. So that's it. I now, uh, Paul, do we have uh, questions from our 
uh, webinar participants. Yeah, thank you, Joey. First, though, no, for yeah. your very in-depth uh, presentation. Before we go on to the questions, I just have a couple of things that I want to ask yeah. you. Sure. Um, so, first, do you think what sort of recovery are you seeing in terms of the re real estate market? When do we start feeling that we're back to where we were pre-COVID? Okay, what we always tell investors is that if we are able to see uh, recovery or if the lockdown and quarantine efforts start uh, to bear fruit the uh, end of June of this year, then we're likely to see um, market sentiment stabilizing or improving second half of 2020. So um, overall, what we see is that while we might experience a slowdown in demand, because objectively the economy is down a lot of business uh, activities are slowing down even global economies are you know grappling to keep their economies and businesses afloat um the recovery will probably happen uh, early 2021 so that's when we will see a spike in demand especially you have to note that interest rates remain low and uh, you know the the financial system of the philippines is in tip-top shape interest rates have never been this low so those are two key factors that will help uh, propel demand and confidence in the residential market so that should uh, kick in starting 2021 I think uh, no, I agree with you. No, uh, interest rates are still low. Yeah, yeah. Which yes. would hopefully you know bring demand back to the same level. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, uh, as I I think I mentioned this earlier, we're no longer seeing the mortgage rates of uh, Asian crisis period of 20, 22 percent, uh, right? So I was still uh, in in elementary then. I don't I don't know about you, Paul, <laughs> <laughs> but you know this is you know what. The low mortgage rates that we're seeing now really help uh, stoke the, the property market and should help instill uh, confidence in the condominium uh, house and lot market here in the Philippines. That's good. Um, you also briefly mentioned in your materials that uh, we're starting to look at density as a concern exactly. or as a whenever you're looking at uh, buying into or yeah. investing into real estate. Yes. Um, with the new... Uh, Balik Provincia program, how, how do you think this would work or how would we make it work? No, How would the government make it work? Well, you know, what, what's important with this Balik Provincia program is that is th this is implemented for the long term. So I believe this is not just a three, six, nine month program. It should even go beyond and be implemented beyond this administration. And one factor that should... Uh, uh, instill or assure that we will uh, benefit from this Balik Provincia program is the Im implementation and construction of infrastructure pro projects across the, the country. As I mentioned, those key areas that will benefit from these are likely Central Luzon, Calabar Zone area, Central Visayas, of course, Cebu. So these are locations that will primarily benefit from this infrastructure program of the government. Why? Because I think I showed this to you earlier. These key regions have a lot of contribution. In fact, I think more than 40, almost 40% 40 to the country's annual economic output. Metro Manila, uh, a very small region compared to these uh, regions, but they, it already contributes 38% to the country's economy. But the uh, these three, prov three regions, uh, they already cover about nearly 40 percent so that's huge right uh and of course uh, the we expect the government national government to focus its infrastructure implementation projects on these three key regions that contribute a lot to the country's economy so um i think even with the uh, with with this you know density issue uh when we when i spoke with a lot of uh, brokers they mentioned that um those that are looking for second home outside of metro manila have been aggressive in, you know, inquiring about uh, projects outside of, of NCR. So uh, they're looking for second home residential unit in Cavite, in Laguna, Batangas, even Pampanga. They're looking for areas that are less dense compared to Metro Manila. Of course, Metro Manila, one of the most dense uh, mega cities in the world. So they're looking now for these less dense communities. And we believe that these are just some uh, areas that uh, will benefit. Of course, Cebu is your 
probably your second biggest, most attractive property investment destination. Uh, it is the most attractive outside of Metro Manila. So it is very, you know, just automatic, natural for uh, res residential investors and, and buyers to gravitate towards these regions and cities. Yeah, I think uh, I agree. No? Uh, we, and we are seeing it in Aboitis land um, where we, because we have a uh, second home uh, type of developments. Yep. Um, the one in Batangas, seafront residences, we've received a lot of inquiries during the yeah. COVID the pandemic. And as well as in Cebu, in Foresa, uh, yeah. which is located in Balamban, a province. Exactly. So I mean, exactly. people really are looking into better master plan communities. Yes. For, you know, yeah. not and all of the, that. Yeah, the convenience of being an integrated community, it's a major consideration for buyers. I mean, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, right, it, it has been a trend. But now that we see this lockdown and its impact on how we live, now it has really, you know, the demand for, for these integrated projects has really surged because of the COVID-19 and the lockdown uh, imposed all over key cities across the country. Okay. Um, I, I still have a lot of questions. Sure, I, sure. <laughs> I think we have to give way to our viewers. Yeah, I think uh, we have a lot more, more time for, for yeah, that. Yeah, so let's go to the questions posted. Can we yep, see it? Sure. Okay. Um, why should people invest in real estate at this time? I think well, you're the person to answer this. As, as I uh, mentioned, no, if you come here in the Philippines, we have limited uh, investment options. So you have the stock market, for instance, and you have the property market. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I showed the slide, which shows the, the, the stock prices, they're very vulnerable to global economic shocks. But for the property market, there has been uh, a sustained pace of increase, especially after the Asian financial crisis of 2000. Uh, in fact, here in the Philippines, if you look at, say, condominium investment or any residential investment, the yield is at about 6 to 7%. And that is one of the highest in the Asian region. So it's no longer surprising to see um, peers from other Asian countries looking at the Philippines because, you know, the Philippines is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, even before this COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, it's one of the regions that a lot of analysts are seeing um, uh, shielding uh, or evading this crisis that will be brought about, brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, this just tells you how competitive the country is, how uh, aggressive the or sustained the GDP growth has been over the past few years. And of course, with these economic factors alone, we can tell you that uh, the Philippine property market is one of the segments that will benefit. We have uh, still a very young mobile workforce that uh, you know has been driving the economy. So you also have to look at the rental prospect. If you say buy a condominium, will there be some employees that will be leasing out these condo units moving forward? You also have to look at the infrastructure projects being implemented by the government. Once those are completed, then surely the demand towards those areas will surge. So again, the Calabar zone, uh, Central Luzon regions, those are very attractive locations. And, you know, it won't be surprising to see a lot of manufacturing investments that will also gravitate towards the industrial locations in those areas because Calabar Zone and Central Luzon are you know, two major industrial hubs in, in not just in Luzon but for the entire country. So that should also help propel the demand for your residential investment. So that just shows you how attractive the uh, residential market still is and uh, sh this should all, all all factors should sustain the demand for the residential market going forward yeah and also i think that people always associate real estate prices with condominiums in metro manila yes but if they look outside of metro manila the the price difference is quite huge exactly it's really affordable and if you yeah. compare it, like you mentioned no, with the asian region we're one of the lowest in terms of property values. Exactly. That's oh. right. That's right. If we compare versus, say, Bangkok or yeah. Malaysia or, you're right, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, most especially, we have one of the lowest prices in, in the region. That's why those uh, investors from Asia that are, you know, trying to maximize their money and, and the earnings and the yields are really 
looking at the Philippines as an investment option. Okay. Let's go to the second question. Sure. Oh, where are the best areas to invest right now? Where are the best areas? Well, uh, one key factor that I have always been mentioning is look at the infrastructure projects being implemented by the government. So the, the developers will definitely follow where these projects are being built. So as I mentioned, uh, the northern central Luzon will be a very attractive location because this is an industrial hub. It's a hub. Pampanga, for instance, is a hub for outsourcing operations. A lot of uh, BPO companies are already operating there. Um, and it is uh, one of the regions in the Philippines that has been growing at a faster pace compared to the national capital region. Of course, uh, Calabarzon area, unsurprisingly, is also a very attractive investment destination because it is an industrial hub. Uh, PBO companies have also been gravitating towards that area. And also the infra projects, which I identified the earlier, uh, most of them also gravitate towards the southern part of the zone. Of course, outside of Metro Manila, again, Cebu in, in the Visayas region, I would say as a good storage of wealth because a lot of investors from Visayas have significantly invested in Cebu. So uh, it's no longer surprising to see a lot of players like Aboitis Land. Of course, Aboitis Land started Cebu. So that's where most of the investments have been. And that's no longer surprising given that it is a very attractive um, investment destination. Of course, that spills over to the residential and office uh, segments. Yeah, I think you know, in Cebu, we're really doing very well, particularly in our affordable brand, Ahoya. Yeah. Yep. And even in our high-end developments, we're, yes. we're seeing a lot of, you know, take up even during this exactly. time. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, looking at uh, Luzon or the, the, the areas that you mentioned, Northern Luzon, uh, the Pampanga, Tarlac, mm. the, the, that air, those areas that we are also located, we're, we're seeing a lot of people who are trying to move into uh, better master plan communities. Yeah, yeah. So I think that can be a trend in terms yeah. of when, where you choose yeah. to invest. Look at yeah, how yeah, yeah. it's planned, right? Um, mm. In fact, you mentioned also infrastructure. So yep. those areas are very well, uh, I mean, good areas to invest in. Um, those that are backed by industrial developments like our project in Lima, uh, I think it's doing very well. No? I, I mean, people are really gravitating towards uh, areas of commercial activities. Yeah, I can, yes, I, I can also support that, Paul, because uh, I'm from Pampanga. I was born and raised in Pampanga. I go back to Pampanga every weekend, except now that we're in a lockdown. Uh, and I can tell you that there has been a very aggressive completion of integrated projects in Pampanga. So, you know, it has also been a trend and has become an investment trend for a lot of uh, Pampanga residential buyers. Okay. Next question. What else? Do, what oh. other questions do we have? <laughs> Where are Aboitis land projects located? I think uh, Paul can, <laughs> aside yeah, from so, those areas we mentioned earlier. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah if, if you visit our website, it's all there. But just to give you a uh, a background, no, we're, mo we're a lot of our projects previously were located in Cebu. So we have a couple of projects there. We have projects in Compostela. We have uh, projects in Balamban. So it spans from different type of markets, different type of products. But in Luzon, we have projects in Capas, in uh, in Tarlac, in, in uh, Cabanatuan, and in Pampanga for Central Luzon. Southern Luzon, we have a project there in uh, Lipa. So it's it's mostly surrounded around those locations where we yeah. are, yeah. Uh, but I guess, I guess visiting our web website, uh, registering, you'll get a more detailed um, information. So, yep, pretty comprehensive list. <laughs> um, from our Facebook viewer from Lisa Ramos, is this the best time to purchase a property, say residential lot? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you are an investor, uh, look at your you know risk profile. Um, perhaps uh, now we are still seeing uh, some bargains in the market. So um, some investors that are still awash with cash will definitely cash in, literally and figuratively, cash in on this uh, demand in the market and the bargains that we're seeing now. Um, every residential investor is opportunistic in nature. 
So they'll definitely look for cheaper options in the market now. And as I mentioned, the interest rates, they are at a historic at historic low. I mean, uh, during the Asian financial crisis, there were double digit, nearly 20 percent, almost 20, more than 20 percent even during the global financial crisis, about seven to eight percent. Now we're looking at five to seven percent. So even lower compared to levels during the global financial crisis. And we have to note that during the GFC, um, the residential prices only moved sideways. There was no significant drop. That's why they were able to immediately recover or pick up uh, pace starting 2010. So that, you know, just shows you how uh, resilient the sector has been even during the global financial crisis, even during uh, time of uh, uh, outbreaks such as SARS or h one and one. So I think as an investor, look at number one, location, location, location. Again, this is this is an old adage that still applies to this day. Um, and look at the track record of the developer. Are they able to complete projects and deliver turnover projects on time? That is important. And also, if you are an end user, of course, look at the convenience. As I mentioned, being in an integrated community is a major consideration right now if you want to lease it out rent it out in in the future look at the rental prospects also are you near major business districts if you is your integrated community adjacent to another business hub when you can uh you know generate those leasing transactions uh, or options in in the near term so those are just key considerations that you also have to keep in mind um with or without a, a pandemic yeah, and I think now uh, developers have responded. Well, us in particular, we've been offering very len lenient yeah. payment terms, and exactly. you won't get these kinds of terms in a normal situation. Exactly, exactly. So if, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're really looking to invest, now's the time, I guess. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I um, agree. Question. Since we're on MECQ or GCQ, we can't do site visits. How do we view your properties? Oh, um, I think this is for us. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you visit our website and talk to one of our agents, I mean, all of our projects are available to be seen virtually. So you can actually move around. It's as if you're there. So, I mean, even if you're not interested in buying, look at it. You'll be impressed on how nice the virtual tours are done so i guess that's the answer to that question yeah and i agree yeah i agree yeah. paul because that's the way to go i mean i speak with a lot of brokers also and uh, um checking projects virtually has been the new normal uh it's the new trend right now so this is really in the way to go so yeah okay next question when will the real estate bubble occur? Do you see it happening? If this happens, do you believe believe this is a jump start that will only be short lived? I think the question is: Are we in a real estate bubble? Do you see it bursting anytime soon? And if this happens, do you believe it will be short lived, Joey? Well, overall, we always say that for 2020, we might see some correction in the residential market, in the condominium market, um, especially for the projects in Metro Manila price from 1.7 to 6 million pesos. That's why I always encourage you know developers, even investors to um, seriously look at key economic indicators in the market, unemployment of W remittances, consumer confidence. So these are... Um, you know, economic indicators that will help dictate that. If you look at uh, 1997, 1998, 1999 Asian financial crisis, it was a more difficult time for the property market because the financial system was in disarray <laughs> during that time. Um, the interest rates were very high, but uh, I believe that uh, after the Asia. Asian financial crisis, the central bank system was reformed. And also during the one of the reasons why we had an easier time recovering during the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 is because number one, we still have the outsourcing sector growing at the time. And then some businesses still occupying more space, which translates to residential demand. So 2009, prices dropped by 1.5%. They recovered 2.1% in 2010. So 
again, that just shows you how resilient the uh, property market uh, was during the global financial crisis. Um, at Colliers, we always say that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is probably worse than the global financial crisis, but not as bad as the Asian financial crisis. So the pace of recovery should probably be between those periods at the midpoint of AFC and global financial crisis. Now, in terms of price reduction, for instance, in Metro Manila, um, we have to look at areas where there's still a huge number of unsold in inventory. And I showed that uh, slide earlier where the areas where there's still a huge number or the concentration of unsold inventory, condominium inventory market are, are located, okay? Uh, so also you have to look at the price segment. So the price segment, condo price segments that are vulnerable to the OFW uh, remittance uh, decrease as well as rise in unemployment will be the residential sectors that are most affected. I think what's good about house and lot projects is that as you move outside of Metro Manila and as you look at more horizontal projects, mm -hmm. um, the, the end user demand gravitates towards the house and lot projects. The vertical projects are prime, primarily focused on, you know, investor, mainly yeah. focused by, on, by uh, or driven by investor demand speculation. But the house and lot projects, these are end user demand driven. So somehow that should, you know, sustain the demand for these house and lot projects in the medium to long term. Yeah, that's why you see OFWs buying house and lots for exactly. their family, right? Exactly. So give them a better way. Exactly. To do it. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, there, there are several projections about OFW uh, remittances. Some are, you know, saying some gloomy projections drop, but you know, some agencies, say ADB, Asian Development Bank, is uh, saying that remittances will still grow, although at a much slower pace. But there's no contraction, and the central bank said that they still grow at a flattish rate. So I think that's one optimistic view on remittances, which should help them drive demand for uh, house and lot projects. Next question, please. Um, from our Facebook viewer, Agko This is for you, Paul. <laughs> Are there any plans for Aboiti's land to go IPO? How do you finance those projects if many people now are keeping tight of their money during this pandemic? Did, did you resume construction already? Um, okay, there are a lot, there, there's a couple of questions <laughs> there. Are there any plans? There are no plans um, to go IPO. And I think your second question is related to that. So how do we fin finance these projects? No? So currently everything that we are, that are in our pipeline is currently funded. So, and obviously most of the funding will come from buyers and we are still seeing people continuously paying their equity payment. So with that, th th those are the funds that we, what we are using to, to complete um, those projects. Um, in terms of the constructions, um, in areas where the enhanced community quarantine has been lifted, MECQ or GCQ, all of our projects located there are already um, undergoing construction. So we're just following this playbook, how to be safe and all of that. But yes, in I think all of our projects, construction has resumed already. Thank you. Next. Is Aboitis land planning to have residential projects in other locations like Iloilo? Um, well, Aboitis land, we always, in Aboitis land, we always look at opportunities outside of where we are currently located. So we are looking at some areas. Unfortunately, I cannot mention that online. But um, yeah, we're, all, we're always looking for opportunities. And if there's an opportunity for us to be in Iloilo, why not? If there's an opportunity for us to be in Davao, why not? I mean, we're always open to looking at uh, areas outside of where we are. But currently, we are planning other projects in other locations, except that I cannot mention it at this moment. Thank May I add a few points, Paul? On a, you know, sure. real estate market research point of view. I think Iloilo is... This is a very interesting question because Iloilo is really one of the boom towns uh, mm -hmm. that has been identified by a lot of investors. Western Visayas uh, is one of the fastest growing regions as well here in the Philippines. Outsourcing 
uh, why is it is one of the most competitive locations for outsourcing in the Philippines. Uh, in fact, uh, Iloilo is an education hub in, in Visayas, right? So a lot of uh, in outsourcing location, outsourcing companies are looking at uh, expanding or putting up their first shop in Iloilo. So uh, I think uh, I cannot comment, of course, on uh, about his land uh, plans, but Iloilo is uh, one of the more competitive uh, location sites in the Visayas Mindanao uh, region. So, yeah. Thank you. Next question. From our Facebook viewer, from Ken Andrew Mandigma. Hi, good morning. Will this pandemic affect the average value appreciation rate of property? If so, how long will it take to recover? Well, we always say that, uh, yes, uh, th there could be a price correction given this uh, COVID-19 pandemic because uh, we are seeing a good number of, say, condominium prices uh, being... Um, or we see a back out in terms of condominium take up here in Metro Manila. So there could probably be some correction that we see in the market and some correction in terms of a rental value. Um, the recovery, as I mentioned, if you look at the global financial crisis, if you consider the amount of period it took BPO companies to occupy space at, as a proxy, it took them six to nine months. Uh, to start leasing out office uh, space, for instance. So in terms of recovery, uh, as I mentioned, it should be between the Asian financial crisis, which took the market a bit longer to fully recover, and the global financial crisis, which is a much shorter period of time. So from six to nine months, we'll probably look at uh, nine to 12 months for, for this one. And the uh, recovery could start kicking in starting uh, early 2021. Okay, um, next question. Is a oh, you answered it already. Nah. Oh, how to buy a this <laughs> online? Um, yeah, so just message us in our Facebook page with your preferred location or project, and then we will we can schedule an online appointment and someone from our group will be in touch, and then reserva reservations are can be done through online banking. So it's that easy, you know. You can view, yeah. you can pay all online. And the cashless uh, transactions, Paul, right, has yeah, you know, really been booming and, and has been uh, really redefining the way we pay, the way we purchase, even, you know, real estate. So it, it also covered by this uh, uh, cashless transactions. I think the central bank has, you know, re been recording, what, three, fourfold increase in terms of yeah. its Insta pay uh, deal. So that really shows you how uh, popular these uh, platforms, cashless platforms have become, and also it is translating to a, a demand in, in the property space. That's true. From Bell Aaron, as an investor, what will happen to a condominium investment after 50 years? Okay. Well, of course, every uh, condominium investor, of course, is part of that the condo corporation. So you have a say in terms of, you know, what will uh, happen to that condominium project after 50 years? Will it be redeveloped? Uh, and if it will be, I mean, if the land will be sold, for instance, of course, you have a share, you have a say in what will be, what will happen to that uh, condominium project after 50 years. But, you know, there's really this uh, notion in the public that after 50 years, it will be, what well, it will be a pared down, right? But th that's not true. Of course, you have a say in what will be, uh, what will, uh, how will that the property be used or repurposed after that period of uh, time? So it's not just immediately it will be uh, pared down or or redeveloped. Yeah. Okay. From Linda Ilaw, good morning. Do you think it is safe to invest real estate now, considering that we are in a pandemic situation? I well, yes, I, yeah, I, I briefly uh -huh. talked about that already because, uh, you know, it, it it's still a major investment option here in the Philippines. So if you have limited uh, investment options and, you know, you don't want the boom bust uh, characteristic of uh, PSE, uh, uh, PSE stock or investment, for instance, stock uh, investment, then probably you should look at the condominium uh, project, condominium investment or a house and lot investment. Again, it depends on your uh, appetite for risk. And also, you know, you also have to, even 
if even if uh, we're under a pandemic in the middle of a pandemic or not of course you have to consider the location the rental prospect if you want to lease it out uh, in the future and of course integrated features which are major considerations for buyers right now okay i think we're down to our last few questions okay okay sure. um this one is from kaiser leanda yeah. First, what's the outlook on condominium prices and vacancy rates, assuming an L-shaped recovery? Second, how has COVID-19 affected foreign demand? And lastly, do you see increased activity in the secondary market as a result of COVID-19? I think these are the remaining questions we have because we have three <laughs> questions in one. But let me answer this. Uh, okay, we're not uh, we're not seeing a V-shaped recovery this time. Uh, it happened during the glo global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. But uh, a lot of analysts and uh, credit rating companies have ruled out the possibility of a V-shape or a faster recovery. Interestingly, um, some analysts are seeing a square root-shaped recovery or the more popular uh, option or choice, of course, or forecast is a U-shaped recovery. So we will probably start seeing a recovery by 2021, but it will not be as fast as uh, the pace, recovery pace we recorded during the global financial crisis. So the condominium prices are likely to drop. Uh, in Metro Manila, our projection is a 15% drop in prices. But of course, that is considering a lot of factors, supply demand. So supply, uh, of course, it has been pared down, but there's still a significant uh, number of condo units to be completed for 2020. That's about 11, close to 11,000 condominium units. On the demand side, of course, we're looking at the leasing uh, options for the outsourcing companies, the POGOs, the offshore gaming companies. And if there will be no new POGO employees that will, or Chinese investors that will occupy or buy new condominium units in the secondary market by 2020, then we will see vacancy in the secondary market rising from 11% to 15%. Now, the uh, drop in prices, of course, depends on the location. As I mentioned earlier, those locations that have a high concentra concentration of unsold inventory will record the steepest drop in prices. And those locations that have high exposure in terms of the affordable to mid-income condo prices, which are most vulnerable to price correction because of a rising unemployment and OFW remittance drop, will of course record the steepest uh, drop uh, as well. And then the same question, how has COVID-19 affected foreign demand? Um, surprisingly, when I spoke with a lot of uh, brokers from, from from a lot of developers, there's still some institutional demand from foreigners in the Middle East, for instance, that are still considering um, buying condominiums here in uh, here in the Philippines. And uh, there's some, for example, physicians, OFWs that have, uh, you know, contacts from other foreign uh, foreign colleagues who are looking at the buying condominium units. And according to them, uh, with the Philippines having one of the more affordable condo prices in the region, they're still considering buying uh, price condominiums here in Metro Manila. Um, in terms of POGO, okay, of course, that's a foreign demand still. The problem is in the office segment, the POGOs are still pre-leasing office space, okay? So they occupy um paying rent good for 12 months. The problem is after 12 months, will they hold on to that office a space because there's no new POGO employees entering the market, right? Because of the travel restrictions. So if there will be no new POGO employees that will occupy additional space, it only means that there will be no new POGO employees or investors that will also buy or lease out condominium units. So that's uh, uh, what we, how we see it in, in terms of a foreign demand for a condominium market, even during this COVID-19 period. And then do you see increased activity in the secondary market? Unfortunately, uh, for the condo market in the secondary market, we've, we've been seeing a slowdown because, and uh, I think if you just look around uh, Makati, for instance, that is that will be very obvious because the work stoppage, you know, um, business operations have practically stopped. So the leasing from outsourcing companies for instance, from a lot of multinational corporations have also stopped. And I know a couple of deals that uh, were supposed to be closed prior to the imposition of a lockdown, right, mid of March, but this didn't push through. Because uh, if you remember, early weeks of March, a lot of 
um, condo corps, a lot of condo unit owners have been have become a little strict with their requirements. They were also require, requiring health clearances from the uh, from the individuals that will lease out their units. And because of you know some units closed and some um, uh, notary offices closed, they weren't able to secure some legal approval or documents. So that uh, held off the uh, leasing transactions, a couple of leasing transactions during this COVID-19 pandemic. So um, we're seeing a slowdown, but hopefully if uh, the market conditions start improving uh, second half of this year, we will see a, a pickup or recovery for leasing in the secondary market during that period. Okay. Thank you, hey. Joey. Uh, before Thank we, you, Paul. Yeah, before we end, just like to say that there's there's still a lot of questions, but unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. we really can't answer all of them in this forum, but maybe in some other opportunities. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, and this is just the first of a series of webcasts that Aboitis Land will host, and we hope that uh, our viewers, which I think peaked at about 489 yeah, viewers. Almost 500, yes, almost yes. 500 viewers. Quite a lot, yeah. Thank you for watching. Yeah. And we'd like to thank Mr. Joey Bondok thank for you, this Paul. informative and engaging first episode of our Aboitis Land webcast. If you guys would like to share a copy of this episode, we are posting the highlights with the link to the video within the next few days. And again, if you want to have more information about Aboitis Land and, and our projects, please go to our Facebook page and just inquire. It's as easy as that. View online all of our properties and ask, talk to one of our people. Um, yep. That's it. Stay safe and yes, healthy. Stay Thanks safe. for watching, guys. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Aboit Islan. Stay safe, guys. Success. Everyone dreams of it. Everyone strives for it. But not everyone achieves it. Success can mean different things to different people. As we pause to celebrate 25 years of Aboitis Land, we ask ourselves, how do we measure success? Aboitis Land was founded in 1994 with humble beginnings in a small office and a vision of creating quality, innovative properties for the Cebu market. And our very first residential development, North Town Homes, a master-planned community now touted as Cebu's most prestigious address. Our very first industrial development, West Cebu Industrial Park in Balamban, a sprawling 268-hectare industrial estate ideal for medium to heavy industries such as shipbuilding and allied activities that helped create thousands of jobs for the residents of Balamban and transformed it from a fourth-class to a first-class municipality. Our first commercial development, the outlets at Pueblo Verde, the first outdoor outlet mall in Cebu, offering exciting new shopping and dining experiences. Emboldened by the success of these pioneering developments, Aboitis Land ventured forth into bigger and more ambitious projects, spreading its footprint in Cebu and beyond. Aboitis Land in 2019 has grown by leaps and bounds since our first inception. Our workforce has grown exponentially and so was our business. Thousands of hectares of land have been transformed into innovative, deliberately planned, and purposely designed residential, commercial, and industrial communities that elevate the living experience. And with our growth come the rewards, not only in revenue, but also in things far more valuable like the number of people whose lives we have touched and changed for the better, our vecinos. Aboitis Land takes this further with various programs designed to give Filipinos a chance to create better ways to live for themselves, ensuring that our developments positively impact our neighbors and our surrounding ecosystem, advancing the communities that host us as we advance our business.
No matter how we quantify 25 years of achievements, it is what we have yet to do that holds the most promise for Aboitis Land. More strategic partnerships to be forged. More fully integrated townships to be built. More industrial parks that fortify businesses and create opportunities. More commercial centers that elevate lifestyles and more residential communities where individuals and families will live, love, and grow. Aboitis Land. After 25 years, one thing is clear. We've only just begun. As we cherish our glorious past and celebrate today's victories, we forge ahead into an exciting future. <laughs>